Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third and final session of the RSAT webinar series, Remote Sensing of Land Indicators of Sustainable Development Goal 15. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and I will be your instructor today along with my colleague, Amber McCollum. For this course, we will have we have had two sessions each day. Session A, which was earlier, was at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and this is session B starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And we created this second session to reach our broader international audience. So today we'll have lectures followed by a demo and then a QA session. You can find all the course materials at the website listed here. This includes past recordings, the presentation materials, and the link to the homework. We will also eventually have each of our presentation materials available in Spanish. So just to let you know, we have the materials in Spanish for the first two sessions. For this third session, it'll be another few days or so before we get the materials available. If there are any additional questions, you can also email me or my colleague Amber McCollum at the email addresses listed below, and then I'll give you those email addresses at the end of this session. We will have one homework assignment after the end of this session, the third session, which will be submitted through Google Forms. Amber's going to post the link um, in the chat box, and it will also be posted on the website. To receive credit for your homework, you have to submit all the answers via Google Forms by July 6th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about three months after the completion of the course. There is one prerequisite for this course. First, you should know and understand the fundamentals of remote sensing. You can watch our on-demand course listed above, which includes two one-hour recorded webinars that you can watch on your own time. As I mentioned previously, you can access all the course materials on the RSET website. Each week, you will be able to find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish. The Spanish versions for this session will be available at a later date. A link to view the recording of each webinar session and the link to the Google form for homework submission. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us keep track of who is viewing them. Once you register, you will automatically be taken to, the, to view the recording. Here's an overview of the course agenda. So in session one, we had an overview of SDG goal 15. In session two yesterday, we discussed SDG target 15.1 and the indicator 15.1.1. And today, session three, we will discuss SDG target 15.3 and indicator 15.3.1. So in addition to discussing the targets and the indicators, we will give you some basic definitions relevant to land productivity and health. We will discuss global satellite-derived vegetation products related to land degradation. And lastly, we will discuss land cover change detection methods using satellite imagery. First, I will start with an overview of target 15.3. SDG target 15.3 says that by the year 2030, it will combat desertification restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, drought and floods, and strive to achieve a land degradation neutral world. Indicator 15.3.1 measures the proportion of land that is degraded over total land area. Land degradation is defined as the reduction or loss of the biological or economic productivity and complexity of rain-fed cropland irrigated cropland, 
or range, pasture, forest, and woodlands resulting from land uses or from a process or combination of processes arising from human activities. Indicator 15.3.1 has several sub-indicators, such as land cover and land cover change, land productivity, and above and below ground carbon stocks that are recognized by the UN as suitable metrics for monitoring and reporting on restoration, combating desertification, and achieving land degradation neutrality, the primary goals for SDG target 15.3. Areas with declining productivity and carbon stocks may be considered degraded, while areas with increasing productivity and carbon stocks may be considered improving. Data to measure these sub-indicators can come from several sources, but satellite Earth observations can be used to set baselines to determine the initial status of these sub-indicators, to detect change, and to determine which areas of change are considered land degradation. The measurement unit for indicator 15.3.1 is the spatial extent in hectares of kilometers square expressed as the proportion of land that is degraded over the total land area. Established in 1994, the UNCCD is the sole legally binding international agreement linking environment and development to sustainable land management. The convention addresses specifically the arid, semi-arid, and dry sub-humid areas known as the drylands where some of the most vulnerable ecosystem and peoples can be found. The convention's 195 parties work together to improve the living conditions for the people in the drylands, to maintain and restore land and soil productivity, and to mitigate the effects of drought. The UNCCD is particularly committed to a bottom-up approach, encouraging the participation of local people, in combating desert, desertification and land. As a result of the current negative trends in land degradation, our communities and ecosystems are less able to ensure food and water security, generate livable incomes, and cope with the impacts of climate change. Many livelihoods in the developing world are closely linked to the productivity of the land, which in turn defines its capacity for climate mitigation and adaptation. First, I will discuss some vegetation definitions and how satellite Earth observations can be used to measure these sub-indicators. Land productivity for plants refers to the production of chemical energy in organic compounds by living organisms, usually through photosynthesis. It often reflects the net effects of changes in ecosystem functioning on plant and biomass growth. Land productivity can be calculated from long-term time series of Earth observation data on net primary productivity to identify areas of declining greenness as an early warning of possible land degradation. Satellite Earth observations can be used to measure proxies of NPP, such as NDVI or biophysical re retrieval, such as the fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation, or FPAR. This diagram shows how vegetation productivity relates to carbon pools and fluxes. Gross primary productivity, or GPP, is the total of all carbon fixed by plants through photosynthesis. Net pri primary productivity, or NPP, is the amount of carbon uptake after subtracting plant respiration, including autotrophic and heterotrophic respiration. Photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR, is the spectral range that is used by plants in photosynthesis. The fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation, or FPAR, is the portion of PAR used by plants. Both precipitation and temperature are two major influences on FPAR. 
Because vegetation growth is related to the rate at which radiant energy is absor absorbed by vegetation, FPAR is an important parameter in measuring biomass production. FPAR can be measured on the ground or inferred from satellite imagery. These are various indices that relate to productivity measures that can be measured by remote sensing. Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, and Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI, is the relationship between visible and near-infrared radiation, which quantifies the photosynthetic capacity of vegetation per pixel. But note that these are not really quantifiable quantifiable measurements. In other words, you can't measure the NDVI vegetation on the ground, but what you can measure is leaf area index, or LAI, which is the leaf area per unit ground area. Or more specifically, for broadleaf canopies, it's the one-sided green leaf area per unit ground area, and for coniferous canopies, it's half the total needle surface area per unit ground area. LAI is related to, but not directly proportional to, NDVI. Different vegetation types exhibit different relationships. In order to address SDG indicator 15.3.1, countries will need to first assess baseline conditions for land cover and productivity and then detect change. I will review some existing land cover products and also describe some products derived from satellite imagery that relate to productivity. Yesterday, in session two, I gave you some information about several global land cover maps, such as FAO's GLC Share, the European Space Agency's Climate Change Initiative land cover product, China's Globe Land product, and the MODIS land cover product. There are several satellite products that relate to vegetation productivity, and I will be discussing the three listed here, the Copernicus Global Land Service Vegetation Products, MODIS Vegetation Products, and the ESA's Vegetation Product. The Copernicus Global Land Service has several different productivity-related products listed here at spatial resolutions that vary from 300 meters to one kilometer. The temporal range depends on the product. You can find out more about these products on the website listed here. The products are all available through a web portal, which I will show you next. This is what the Copernicus Global Land Service web portal looks like. On the right, you can see the available products. If you click on the eye, you can get information about each of these products. In the map, you can zoom into your region of interest to find out what products are available for that region. You can also specify a start and end date on the right, as well as specify coordinates for a region of interest. These are the MODIS vegetation products available related to productivity. The FPAR, GPP, and NPP products are available at 500 meter spatial resolution at eight day composites and the vegetation indices are available at various spatial resolutions at various temporal resolutions. This is the Earth Data web portal where you can access and download the MODIS imagery. Amber gave you a demonstration of this web portal at the end of yesterday's session. The European Space Agency vegetation product originates from the SPOT vegetation program, which began in 1998. It ended in 2013, but has been replaced by the Proba V mission. The SPOT mission had two instruments, VEG1 and VEG2, with an overall objective to provide accurate measurements of the basic characteristic of vegetation canopies on an operational basis. There are two types of products, a daily product, which is synthesized between the two instruments that includes ground reflectance and NDVI, and a 10-day product of NDVI maximum values. The spatial resolution of these data are 1.15 kilometers. 
The Proba V mission was developed as a follow up to the Spot Vegetation Mission and preparation for the ESA Sentinel 3 Land and Ocean Observation Satellite Mission. The spectral channels are similar to Spot VGT, but the platform is smaller than a cubic meter. There are several available products, including Top of Atmosphere and NDVI products available at 100 meter. 300 meter and one kilometer spatial resolution. You can get the Spot and Proba V products through the ESA product distribution portal. The ESA product distribution portal looks just like the Copernicus portal with the data products listed on the right as well as the ability to sele select the dates and regions of interest. Land cover change provides a first indication of a reduction or increase in the extent and degree of fragmentation in natural habitats or ecosystems, as well as potentially adverse land conversions. Land cover change is an essential component for the assessment of trends in land degradation, restoration, and carbon stocks. I will discuss various methods that are used to develop land cover change products from satellite imagery. Land cover change is the conversion of the landscape from one dominant feature type to another. Examples include changes in tree cover due to wildfire or land clearing and urbanization. The images on the right show the increase of urban growth in Santiago, Chile from 1975 to 2013. Information that can be derived from satellites include where and when has change taken place, how much and what type of change has occurred, and what are the cycles and trends in the change. Using satellite imagery, you can detect fairly broad categories of change, such as the change in shape or size of patches of land cover type. A good example of this is urbanization. A second type of change could be the slow changes on cover type of species composition, like succession versus abrupt land cover transition due to wildfire or deforestation. A third category of change includes slow changes in condition of a single cover type, such as forest mortality due to insect or disease. Finally, changes in timing of extent of seasonal processes, such as drought monitoring, can be detected with satellite imagery as well. As you recall, every object on Earth has its own spectral response curve. The typical spectral response curve of healthy green vegetation is shown here with relatively high response in the green wavelength and very high response in the near infrared wavelengths. Vegetation change can be detected as changes in the spectral values of pixels. In this example, a burned forest has low spectral values in the green and near IR wavelengths and high spectral values in the mid infrared wavelengths. If you have one image that's pre fire and one image that's post fire, you can see a distinct difference in pixel values in these areas. There are several different change detection methods using satellite imagery. I will discuss four of them. Visual analysis, classification approaches, image differencing, and temporal trajectories. One of the most basic methods for detecting change using satellite imagery is called heads up digitizing. In this method, you can display the imagery using GIS or image processing software and digitize a polygon around the areas of change. In these images, the Santiago urban area was digitized for the two different years. The size of these polygons can then be measured to quantify the amount of change that has occurred. This approach is good for measuring large changes like the shape of size of patches. 
Digitizing urban growth is a good example of this. However, this is not a good approach for detecting subtle changes like land degradation. Another change detection approach uses image classification methods. These methods use the changes in the pixel values to document change. Image classification requires that both dates of image stacks, so the image stacks are comprised of multiple bands in the image, be classified first to identify land cover classes by pixel. Then, using a pixel-by-pixel -pixel comparison, change between land cover types can be detected. For this method, it is very important that the images are precisely registered to each other. The advantage to this approach is that it's very easy to compute using geospatial software. The disadvantage is that errors in classification of each date will result in errors in detecting change. The image subtraction method works by simply taking a single band from two different dates of imagery and subtracting one from the other. That results in a change image. The change image consists of a positive and negative values where change has occurred and zero values where no change has occurred. The advantage to this approach is that it can detect subtle changes, but it may be difficult to interpret. Recent developments in change detection methods take advantage of the entire freely available Landsat archive by using monthly or annual time series to look at changes or trends. While in the previously described method, you would use only two image dates, in this method, you could use 20 or 30 image dates. This method allows the capture of short duration disturbance events as well as long-term disturbance trends. This approach is founded on the recognition that change is not simply a comparison between conditions at two points in time, but rather a continual process operating at both fast and slow rates on landscapes. There are several different algorithms emerging, and this is an example of LandTrender developed by Robert Kennedy et al. at Oregon State University. The results of this algorithm include the magnitude of change that identifies the percent of tree cover loss, the duration of the disturbance, and the year of onset of the disturbance. There are several important considerations when using satellite imagery to detect change, no matter what method you choose. First and foremost, you need to minimize the amount of spectral change caused by seasonal variation and phenology. If you are looking at annual change, it is best to choose imagery from approximately the same time of year and ideally the same month. Images must be precisely registered to each other, otherwise you will get change resulting from misregistration. Lastly, you must atmospherically and radiometrically correct the imagery to reduce changes due to atmospheric and radiometric differences in the image dates. In summary, in order to address SDG indicator 15.3.1, you can use products derived from satellite imagery to determine vegetation productivity, including NPP, NDVI, and FPAR. There are existing productivity products available from MODIS and from ESA. You can assess land cover change with satellite imagery using several different methods. But note that all land cover mapping and change detection methods require extensive ground information for validation. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Amber McCollum to do a demonstration for you on Global Forest Watch. So bear with us for just a minute while we make the switch. All right, thank you, Cindy. So we are going to talk about Global Forest Watch for this demonstration, and I'm going to go ahead and play my video now here. 
For this demo, we will focus on a tool for visualizing and downloading land cover data created by Global Forest Watch. Here's the Global Forest Watch website. If you click on About here and then About Global Forest Watch, you can see that Global Forest Watch is an interactive online forest monitoring and alert system designed to empower people everywhere with the information they need to better manage and conserve forest landscapes. We are interested in using Global Forest Watch interactive map to visualize how land cover types are changing globally. So we will click on explore up here along the top panel and then GFW interactive map. When you first come to this web page, you'll automatically have um, the tree cover gain layer and the tree cover loss layer displayed here and shown on the left. There are many different layers and you can turn on and off these categories. So we have things under forest change, land cover, land use, conservation, people, stories, and country data. For this demo, we'll explore a few of these layers. We'll begin by turning off the tree cover gain and tree cover loss layer by clicking on these X's here. Then we will go up to the land cover tab and select land cover 2009. You will see this automatically populates a map. If you click on the eye icon um, right next to the um, layer, you can get more information um, about what this layer in, entails. And it takes a um, couple seconds to load here. Um, but many of these layers come from different data sources, so it's really important to look at the information um, about the, the data layer. So you can see here, um, if you scroll down to the overview section, you can see that this layer is generated primarily using the MARIS satellite, which is operated by the European Space Agency and has a resolution of 300 meters. Classification was generated, generated using unsupervised and supervised schemes. This represents the 2009 classification. You can also download the data here. If you click on this, you'll be redirected to the ESA website. So let's close this information pane and go to our region of Malaysia that we examined in our demo from yesterday. You can do this with your mouse or by clicking on the plus and minus symbols at the bottom here. You can see that some of the categories are different from our type one classification scheme that we used in MODIS, but they are similar. Much of the region is characterized by broadleaf evergreen or semi-deciduous forest, this category here. You may also notice that there appears to be more cropland along the coastal regions than we saw in our 2001 MODIS land cover map, right around here. So now let's go briefly back to our MODIS project and do some qualitative comparisons. So I'm going to open up QGIS. We can also examine if the MODIS land cover appears to change over time in the same region. So here I have a map open with each of my MODIS layers added and organized from 2001 to 2013. Remember the naming convention of MODIS has the year here. I've categorized the land cover classes for 2001 as we did in the previous demo. As we did in the last demo, to apply the same scheme to all the classes, we go to Layer Properties. And then in the Style panel, we can choose the single band pseudo color and then load that land cover colors file that I created previously and click on Open. So I've already done this for each of the yearly files here. So they all have the same categories and color schemes. I've also added the Google physical layer here at the bottom just for reference. So we could click these layers on and off to see how our land cover categories have changed over time. This may also provide some evidence of forest loss if we see a change from forested area to non-forested area. So 
if we look in these regions here, especially along the north central coast, where we saw some croplands in the global forest watch layer for 2009. So if we uncheck each yearly modus layer, we can see an expansion of croplands in red in this region and natural cropland in yellow to the north. From a qualitative standpoint, we can see there appears to be some conversion of the evergreen broadleaf forest into some type of cropland. And there are a variety of ways that you can go through and, and look at these different layers. Um, this is just a very simple way to make some assessments. But we can see in general, when we get to 2010, with our modus land cover, there appears to be much more cropland, um, particularly in these regions. So if you just go in and click these layers on and off one more time, we can go through this time series and particularly look at this region here, as well as this region here. So now I'll just um, click through and click these off so you can see the yearly progression. You could also do some calculations in specific regions of interest using raster calculator, raster calculation and analysis in QGIS. So now that we think there's some change occurring in this region based on our modus images, particularly in these regions, we could compare that to what we're seeing in our Global Forest Watch map. So if we go back to our Global Forest Watch interactive map, we can take a look at some of these dynamics. First, we'll turn off this land cover layer, and then we'll go to Forest Change and click on Tree Cover Loss. So again, if we click on this information icon right next to the data set, you can um, scroll down to the overview section and see that this layer measures tree cover loss globally at a 30 by 30 meter resolution. This layer is created primarily using Landsat data. There is also more information here, including some precautions to take up at the top. And also some clarifications about the definition of tree cover and how loss is calculated. Again, if you're interested, you can download the data here or open in ArcGIS, which is similar to QGIS. Now, if we close this information panel, you can see that there is an animation pane here along the bottom. So this will show you tree cover loss over time. So if I click on play, you can see tree cover loss from 2001 to 2015 in these regions. Notice a large amount of loss occurring in our study area. And we can see this progress throughout the years. If we go up to forest change and take a look at tree cover gain, we can also compare this. And it's important to, to know that this is a static layer that's a cumulative 12-year layer, also using 30-meter Landsat data. So now that we see um, some interesting dynamics happening here, um, you can find ancillary data to help inform you of those dynamics. So if we go to the land use panel, here you can see information on things like managed forests, mining, and dams for selected countries. We will select oil palm and turn off the forest cover change layers for now. Again, this information icon next to the layer can provide you with some good background, especially the data sources, the um, geographic coverage. So for some of these layers, they're only in specific um, countries of the world and some more information. So the oil palm layer shows a large extent of oil palm plantations in Malaysia and Indonesia here to the south. So this may provide us with some more information about the possible conversion of forests into oil palm plantations in this region of the world. You could also view the oil palm layer and the tree cover loss layer together to see if those regions coincide. 
So you can see along the, this north central coast region here, there appears to be a conversion of natural forest to oil palm. While this was just one example of the types of things you can do with the Global Forest Watch interactive mapper, um, we encourage you all to explore this further. There's a lot of interesting things that you can do um, and case studies you can analyze on your own and compare with other types of, of data that are available like the MODIS um, data out there for land cover. So that concludes the um, demo portion for um, today's webinar. And so if you just um, bear with me for, for a moment here, I am just going to switch over the reins back to Cindy Schmidt. And we have quite a bit of time um, this evening for um, other additional comments and questions. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention before um, I hand it over to Cindy is that we have a um, survey that you will receive via email um, within the next day or so. And we really appreciate any feedback um, that you could provide us about, about this webinar. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Cindy here. Thanks, Amber. And so while my screen is coming back up, what's coming up now is the list of contacts again. So it's my email and Amber's email. So if you have any questions about um, this webinar series or anything else about the previous webinars that we've done on land management or wildfires, please feel free to contact us. If you have general RSET questions, you can contact Anna Prado. She is the lead for RSET. And then again, we have our RSET website that have all our recorded webinars as well as exercises for some of the more advanced webinars. And I did want to mention again, and I know I mentioned this yesterday, that we do have a really nice advanced webinar series on supervised classification using QGIS, the open source geospatial software. Um, and that might be really useful for you if you're interested in doing classification. So at this point, we will open it up to questions and answers. You can type your questions in the question box here, which you, many of you have already been doing. Um, you, if you're interested, you can also type your name, um, location, organization, email address, whatever you'd like to put in there to connect with your fellow land remote sensing professionals. Um, we'll, and then we'll try to sort of post this out as you post your, post your name. Um, it's a great way to connect with each other. One thing I want to do that I want to um, also ask of you, last night I asked the same question, is if you wanted to see future webinars, what would you like to see webinars focused on? Um, and I know a lot of people in yesterday's session, as well as the earlier session today, were interested in accuracy assessment, in change detection, um, in radiometric correction, um, lots of things like that. Um, and then some focus on specific thematic areas like, you know, wetlands or coastal areas or, or, or things like that as well. So if there's something um, that you'd like to let us know that you'd be interested, we're, we're always open to suggestions of what we can do in the future. Lastly, one other thing I would like to ask you is if any of you are actually um, trying to work with the SDGs, the indicators, the targets or the indicators. We're really curious to know, you know, which countries are focusing on SDGs um, and, you know, what role you play in that. So if any of you are working on that in that area right now, you can let us know too. That would be um, really interesting to us. Yeah, so somebody mentioned, um, I see the questions, are, the 
comments are starting to roll in now. Um, Sylvia said it is important to have a consistent time interval for change detection. So for example, five-year interval within a 20-year period, or you can select your intervals um, on, you know, pertaining to the ground conditions. And she's absolutely right about that. Um, you know, the nice thing about the change trajectories is that you can do very small intervals, you can do yearly intervals and still get sort of the, the broader change conditions as well. Um, but that's a more challenging approach to do. You need some um, specific um, software and programming ability to, to run that. But for the basic change detection methods like the image subtraction or the classification methods, uh, you know, picking those intervals is really important. So that's a really good point, Sylvia. So there's a question um, of whether there's MODIS um, or NASA products for detecting glacier loss. Yes, yeah, so there are uh, NASA products out there. We're not focusing on that. I'm, you know, I'm not sure if we actually have even a webinar right now focused on snow regions. Um, I think there was one quite early, a few years ago about um, snow and ice and things like that. Um, but yes, there are NASA products out there that can detect uh, glacier loss, and there's some great visualizations on how uh, large bodies of ice are actually melting. And uh, maybe we can get you some information on that in the, in the future. Thank you for putting your contact information. That's really great. So here's a suggestion for please, please arrange webinars on climate change, climate change, uh, GCMs, RCMs, land surface temperature, rainfall measurement by remote sensing. I know there have been some webinars in the past on, on rainfall, on the use of trim data and also the um, GPM data. So you might take a look at um, some of the other webinars that we have offered in those areas. So there was a question about what we focused on. We focused on plant cover as sustainable standard, but what about other factors and elements? I mean, certainly there are many, many other factors and elements um, that are important for sustainability. Um, we focused on plant cover because it specifically really was addressing the indicators that we that we were focusing on, which was 15.1.1 and 15. 0.3.1, and they specifically mentioned forest cover, and that's one of the things that's pretty standard and pretty um, pretty straightforward about uh, using satellite imagery for. Some of the other things are not so easy, so that's why we only focused on plant cover for this particular webinar series. There are there will be other webinar series focused on other SDG indicators, um, such as there was one not too long ago on air quality, and there will be some other ones focusing on other areas in the future that may not necessarily have to do with plants, but this particular one had to do with primarily forest and the detection of satellite, the detection of force change using satellite imagery. Oh, this is great. Sandra from, from Columbia. I am working in the National Statistics Office. We are using Landsat imagery to calculate indicator SDG 11.13.1. That's wonderful, Sandra. It'd be great to learn more about what you're doing. Oh, here's somebody who works for Severe. Hi, Alex. 
Um, we know SERVIR very well because um, SERVIR is sort of like a sister program to RSET. So welcome. So there's a question here about forest loss means changes in soils hydrodynamic behavior. What kinds of remote sensing images are suitable to deduce those changes and relate them to um, climate change models? So that's a that's a really difficult question to answer, um, primarily because forest loss is easy to detect with satellite imagery because satellites are detecting canopy it's hard to detect what's going on beneath the canopy. Um, and that's the challenge with using satellite images. So if you have changes going on underneath the canopy, you're not gonna be able to detect that with satellite imagery. If you are able to look at soils without a canopy over it, then there are, um, well, there's the Landsat, uh, the mid infrared bands are useful for looking at soil moisture. There's also the SMAP um, imager, which uh, looks at soil moisture as well. And now there's a new product coming out that combines SMAP and the radar from Sentinel that is giving you sort of a higher spatial resolution um, look at soil moisture. So I think probably next year we'll think about doing some kind of webinar focused on um, that combined product between Sentinel and SMAP and really looking at so soil moisture. So Charlotte is in Florida and she is looking for, she's using remote sensing for the evaluation of forest protection projects. Um, are there yearly global tree cover data sets available like the one provided by Global Forest Change for 2000? So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Charlotte, why can't you use the global tree cover data sets <laughs> um, for your project. Are you looking for other dates or, or I'm not quite sure specifically what you're looking for. That might be, if you want to email me at some point that we might be able to dig into that a little bit deeper. So here's someone who said they would like to suggest a webinar on agriculture index insurance. Um, so I think we probably will f do, we might plan one, at least one webinar focus on agriculture next year. I think that's a great idea. We've got a lot of requests for that. Um, and just to let you know, we are doing another webinar on drought starting in July. So you can go, go on the RSET website and uh, Amber and I will both be working with our colleague Amita Mehta on doing um, a webinar series on drought.
I really appreciate all the great information you're giving us about the work that you do. This is really interesting. So there's someone that was saying they're waiting for a webinar about mine exploring or petrol exploring. So those kinds of satellites tend to be uh, hyperspectral and we don't have any hyperspectral satellites in space at the moment that are operational anyway. So that kind of remote sensing really needs um, a hyperspectral sensor, which is currently only flown, really only flown on aircraft. Yeah, this is a great idea about it would be great to have a case study for processing Landsat and Sentinel-2 images to compare vegetation with a fo focus on crops. I, I think that's a that's a great idea um, and, and I really I, I think we'll try to focus at least one of our webinar series on agriculture and on crops. We also are discussing doing a short webinar series comparing the Sentinel-2 images um, to the Landsat and how they can be used together and also the Sentinel to the Sentinel images um, with the the SMAP data the soil moisture active passive mission So here's a question. How can we rely on the accuracy of the data obtained from such GIS tools if it is not applicable for under forest cover? So Priya, that's a really good question. And I think you just have to realize the limitations of working with satellite imagery. So when you work with satellite imagery, it's sort of like if you're flying over in an airplane and you're taking a picture of that area with a, your camera from that airplane. And that's what the satellite can see. It can't see under the forest cover. So you can get accuracy of maybe forest. There, there are certain characteristics about forest that you can get information from satellites about. So it might be forest health. So if the forest is dying, if the forest is being cut, um, if the forest is being burned, those kinds of things. But for conditions under forest cover, you're not ju you're just not going to be able to get that very easily with satellite imagery. Um, you might be able to get at that if you have maybe lidar imagery um, or radar imagery that can penetrate that forest canopy and get to the ground. Um, but that's a completely different sort of processing um, capabilities that you would have to have. Oh, here's a great question. What about marine productivity? So, of course, we're we're focusing on land um, land productivity with this webinar, and that's the area that we uh, Amber and I both have expertise in. But we do have somebody on the RSAT staff that does focus on marine productivity, and she will be doing a webinar series on harmful algal blooms, I believe, coming up um, fairly soon in the fall. And then she did a basic overview of using satellite imagery for ocean and coastal applications. So I highly recommend that you take a look at that um, webinar series.
All right, at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and end this webinar. I really thank you all very much for attending. Um, I love the input that we got on the questions about what you're doing and where you're from, and I hope we've been able to answer some of some of your questions, but if we haven't, please feel free to email us. Um, we'll, we'll try to help if we can. And I look forward to having you participate in future RSET webinars. Thank you all very much.